On Two Wheels this week, Jeff spends the day at Stafford for a bike show with a difference. It's full of Japanese classics. Also, Wayne and I spend the day on a couple of Kimco scooters. Now, whenever you think of classic bikes, people think of classic British iron. But there's more to it than that. There's lots of classic Japanese bikes around and Italian bikes. But we'll start with this one. Really is a, a classic. The first Honda 750, the CB 750. Four exhaust systems there. Just imagine having a bike with four silencers in the late 60s, 1969, this one. Single overhead cam, engine, four-cylinder air cooled across the frame, electric start. And disc brakes too, well at least a disc brake up the front end. And this was quite novel in its time, stainless steel discs so that it looked nice, but one big problem with it, in the wet weather, they just didn't work. Well, 10 years on and Honda had moved on somewhat to this, the 1000cc CBX. Six cylinder, double overhead cam, six carburetors, looked a really impressive bit of kit. But it only produced about 106, 110 brake horse, I seem to remember, but nevertheless, very, very smooth bike. Only ran until 1982 when they produced this one, the Super Sports. Interestingly on this, they started to pro-link rear suspension with the single shock absorber. And I always remember I went round as a pillion passenger on the back of one of these with Charlie George round Donington. And he was decking everything on this, but it was quite a tall and I've never forgotten that. Very smooth, respect as they say. If you thought Street Fighters were something new, what about this? 1980 CBX motor in a French-made frame, Motor Martin. And it really looks pretty tricked, doesn't it? All this steel tubing but chrome-plated. The wheels look a bit odd these days, big gold anodized um, alloy wheels. But uh, an early Street Fighter, if ever there was one. Well, how about this? Another Honda from the 1980s, CB1100R. Very few of these imported into the UK, only about 100 in fact. This one's had its fairing removed and it really does look neat, doesn't it? You can really see a sort of speed triple influence in this or perhaps the other way around. But 1100cc motor, lots of special bits in there. And these were raced by Joey Dunlop, Ron Haslam and Wayne Rainey, just to name a few. But uh, quite a potent tool, 115 brake horsepower. It was quite something to contend with and it still looks really tasty. Now Kawasaki, always the king of the road. Well they are to me, perhaps I've overstated it a bit, but I'm a Kawasaki fan anyway. But just look at this, it's absolutely immaculate. This is the Z900, first introduced in 1973 and tested by Motorcycle News at 134 miles an hour. That was quite some speed back then and this blew the CB750 Honda absolutely into the weeds. But in fact, as you can see from these high bars, if you were the rider, it'd blow you into the weeds too. Very high rise bars, but uh, fantastic example this one. And um, still a blistering bike. Now over the years the 900 engine grew to 1000cc, still air cooled, and this is one version of it, 1978, the Z1R. They tried to give it a more European feel instead of that American feel, slightly lower bars, more angular tank and a little nose fairing up the front there. Pretty rare bike, but it still looks pretty neat and again in immaculate condition. Now around 1978, the same time that Honda developed the CBX, Kawasaki were not to be outdone again. So they came with a 1300cc water-cooled six this time, double overhead cam, three carburetors on it, and also uniquely on this one, a shaft drive. But this was a really massive, heavy lump of a thing. Just look at the size of it, a massive petrol tank. Again, very high bars and that big square headlamp. Not actually a very pretty bike. But this one is immaculate, as they all are here. But I always remember there was a Swedish guy called um, Nils Lundqvist, who actually used to wheelie one of these and break the back number plate off. So there's nothing new, even in stunt riding. Can you imagine wheeling one of these? Now you've seen the new Kawasaki, the W650. Well, this is the W1, very much based on a BSA A10. Any of you who've seen the old Beezers around will recognize it. It's virtually identical, the timing case there, iron cylinder barrel, alloy cylinder head, very, very similar. This was in the days when they did used to copy, and even the gearbox there, it's got a rocking pedal gear shift on it, as you can see, but the gearbox is a BSA pattern. 
and over on the other side here, the, time, uh, the um, primary chain case is virtually identical. But as I say, this was getting Kawasaki off the ground, so they made a copy, but as I understand it, it didn't use to leak oil. Well, of course, you can't think about Kawasaki's without thinking of their two-stroke past. Here's a couple of them, the KH500, three-cylinder air-cooled two-stroke, a really wheelie mad machine. The frame was a bit, shall we say, a flexible friend at that time, a bit spindly, so the handling left something to be desired. But if the 500 was bad enough, this, the 750, was really it. Open the throttle in any gear and you were on the back wheel. Really wheelie king. But uh, look at that massive engine. Killed off by the American emission rules, you couldn't have big three-cylinder air-cooled two-strokes. Far too smoky, far too dirty. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, that's right. Seven-cylinder air-cooled Kawasaki. 606 cc, it says there, because this was handmade by a Kawasaki enthusiast. Not in Kawasaki's listing, obviously, but an incredible bike for all that. And it works, too. Now, Laverdas, we've tested these on the programme, the Diamante and the Ghost, etc. But they did have a previous life. In the mid-70s, they produced this 750cc double overhead cam twin. And the uh, keen ones amongst you will see that that engine looks very, very similar to the 250 and 305 Honda Dreams of the early 70s. I'm not saying they copied, but you can see the similarity. But the more famous one, the one they really made the name with in the UK, was the big three-cylinder, 1,000cc, 3C. 3C for three-cylindry. And this is it, massive lump there, very long crank. And in fact, people who dropped these ended up bending the end of the crank, breaking the alternator off. But a nice big engine in there, 180 de degree crank, which they changed later to 120, but the 180 degree gave a great lumpy feel to the engine, gave it a hell of a lot of character. But the most famous one that we got in the UK was prepared by the importers, which was Slater Brothers, and they prepared this, the Laverda Jota. High compression pistons and some other tweaks to the cams, and this was a really top production racer in its time. It's also had these very special handlebars, which came known as um, Jota bars, because they were multi-adjustable. You can adjust them up and down and round, all from the top here. So it was no clip-ons, but a very neat bar and a hell of a bike, hell of a lot of character. Very nice too. Now you don't see many of these today. These are fondly known as Suzuki's Kettle because this was a three-cylinder 750 water-cooled two-stroke. And uh, with that nice big water jacket round there, hence came the Kettle. But this real claim to fame with this one, Barry Sheen raced these and it was unusual that in fact he raced a race version of a road bike. And normally it's the other way around these days but a real blistering performance in its time. Mid 70s, good for 120 mile an hour, about 75 horsepower. But again, American emission rules killed it off. Smoky two strokes, I'm afraid. But it looks quite a neat bike. And even though it's only three cylinder, you actually get four exhausts here. So it looks uh, quite cool. Now, another two stroke Suzuki, this one, three cylinder again and a 380cc, and see this? This is the first ram air system. So nothing new on the Kawasaki's and Honda's and all the rest of it. Been ram air about since the mid 70s. All it did was just scoop air in at the top and straight through the fins. It was nothing to do with the carburation. Just a bit of trick marketing really, but it looked good. It appealed to people then. But next to it, you can see the Suzuki Katana. This is the 1000cc. Very, very distinctive styling, as you can see, very angular. Even the seat is styled differently, it's a mixture of blue and that grey. And it caused quite a shockwave when it was introduced because it looks so different and so modern. But uh, big front wheels which look a bit outdated now. But uh, nice looking bike. Big by then a proven um, Suzuki motor being 82. And a nice bit of kit, and a bit of a collector's item now, needless to say. Now before the Katana came along and while they were still phasing out the 750 triple two-stroke, the kettle I told you about, this came along, the GS750, introduced at the Earl's Court Show in 1976. Four-cylinder overhead cam, the first big four-stroke from Suzuki. And this one completely air-cooled, unlike the later GSXR that we all know now, which were all cooled versions. This one's 1978 and um, absolutely immaculate. It looks like new, straight from the crate. 
But over here, we've got another interesting bike. A turbocharged Suzuki, would you believe? XN85, it says on the side. But in fact, it was 636cc, a rather odd size. And I don't know why that is. But it's got a turbocharger on it, tucked down behind the engine here, just a small one there. And this one, believe me, hasn't been restored. It is as new. But uh, all the Japanese manufacturers made turbos at one stage, Honda, Kawasaki and Yamaha. But uh, this is a very, very nice example. Now, if you're talking about classic Japanese kits, you cannot miss out the GPZ 900R. I bought one of these in 1985. Identical to this one, except for the seat. This is a non-standard seat, but these are absolutely a blistering bike. 154, 155 miles an hour, and it was the first big Japanese bike that actually handled and did everything that it should do. And it looked neat as well. Big water called Kawasaki motor. Um, a real soft spot I had for this. In fact, I kept it for uh, seven years altogether, and uh, I love the thing. But, um, and it brings back a lot of fond memories. A very nice bike. Now, if you got your license in the 70s, you'll probably recognise these because these are sports mopeds. The moped was defined as having to be powered by pedals. So even though these look quite racy, when you look down below, you'll see the pedals there, which uh, slightly spoilt your image. But if you were image conscious, what you could have had was one of these. A Harley lookalike chopper, complete with pedals. Of course, no classic bike show is complete without British classics, and the BSA Gold Star is one of those. But this one's a model, and this is the guy who's made it. Les, this thing is absolutely incredible. I mean, just to see it through the camera viewfinder, you do think it's, it's real. So, how long has it taken you? I've been working on the bike itself now for five or six years. Uh -huh. uh, in time, I know of 4,200 hours oh, I now spent. What are, you, are you a model builder by no, profession? No, no, I have a motorcycle business. Oh, right. Yeah, right. This is just a, a passion This is just of yours. a hobby. Yeah. But is it a working model? Yes, everything on it works as the original bike. Yeah, including this tiny chain that I've noticed. Yeah. Now you haven't made that, have you? No, the chain is off of the old C100 Honda 50. Yeah. I just ground it down to get the thickness right. Oh my God. And that was to get some clearance, was yes. it, behind the old... Uh, yeah. and, and you've got a little, I was going to say it's a model of the clutch, but that is a real That is clutch. a working part of the clutch, just yeah. the same as all the rest of it. Yeah. Right. And so as you pull the control levers, the real clutch is going to work? Yes, yeah. that's correct. And, and yep. what about firing it up? Now, now, I do know that it hasn't yet run, but it's going to, yeah? It is going to do, yes. So hopefully, uh, a year this Christmas is my aiming point yeah. to get it complete. And, and you've, you've made the whole thing yourself, haven't Every you? Every single item on it. Yes. I think it's absolutely incredible, and it's a real credit to you. But who are you going to get to ride it? Well, Tommy Rob. <laughs> And coming up after the break on two wheels, we move on from the older technology to the very latest available in the world of scooters. Wayne and I spend the day on a couple of models from the current Kimco range. What is the biggest selling type of motorcycle in the UK? I bet you think it's them superbikes, don't you? Or even the classic cruiser. Possibly the great big fancy retros. Nah, it's this type, the scooter. Scooters come in all shapes and sizes from the little tidgy 50cc ones right the way through to the big fancy 400cc Bergman. Well, this particular one that I'm sat on is called a Cobra Cross and it's by a company called Kimco. Yes, Kimco. Never heard of them, have you? Well, you will be hearing of them because they're a massive company and Kimco is an acronym. It actually stands for the Quang Yang Motor Company and that's the only time I'm going to say that. But they've been around some time now. They were founded back in 1963, all the way over there in Taiwan. And the company's owned, well, 75% of the company is owned by five families collectively. And interestingly, the other 25% is owned by Honda. And yet again, another history lesson of Paul. I bet he was a right swat when he was at school. 
Anyway, this little baby here is only one of 12 different models available from Kimco here in the UK. And they range from this little one, 50cc, right up to the 125 size machines. Now this particular one is one of two models very similar. This is the Cobra Cross and there is in fact a Cobra Racer. Both of them have the same engine. It's 49.5cc with a whopping amount of power, 5.2 horses. Uh, very impressive, eh? Well, if that's not enough for you, and it's not enough for some people, you might want something a bit bigger. So how about this? Another one from the range. This is the Spacer 125. This is a four-stroke water-cooled engine. You can get this Spacer in a 50cc version, which is physically at the same size. So if your street cred's important to you, then maybe you'd want one of those. This, wait for it, develops a fantastic 11 horsepower. Well, it's not that unimpressive, really, because it will still do 70 miles an hour. And I reckon across a busy city through busy town traffic, you would keep up with any superbike. You can only go so fast on certain roads. But it's typical sort of scooter configuration and doesn't look, really, I don't think, doesn't look too unlike Piaggio's Hexagon or even Yamaha's Majesty. All a similar sort of format. Feet first, dead easy to ride. Rev and go again, same as Wayne's Cobra. Nice dashboard on this one. Not unlike a car dashboard, actually. And look at this over here. We've got this. You can pay a lot of money, thousands of pounds, for big super bikes, and they haven't got a fuel gauge. So, good point there. Well done, Kimco. And I've got to show you this under the seat. Key goes in the side here. Look at that. You can get tons and tons of stuff in there. You can fit a full face helmet in there, just about. But uh, it is a tight fit. But if you had an open face, which you tend to use on this type of machine, no problem. Butters in the back, bit of shop in there. And away you go. Well, he's not the only one with an under-the-seat compartment. I've got one, look. I just pop the key in there. Up oh, pops the old seat. And underneath is my helmet in a compartment. Although this one hasn't got any form of illumination because that's the deluxe model over there. But this is the place where you put your petrol and also you stick your two-stroke oil in there. I put a glove over my helmet. You may ask why. It's not so I can throw on the gauntlet down. No, no, no. It's just to cover it up so the seat here does not scratch the top of my fancy painted helmet. Eh, simple, but worth it. The key. I'll stick the key in the ignition for the moment, but I do want to point out that, again, he's not the only one with a petrol gauge. I've got a rev counter, speedo, petrol gauge, and all the indication on the dashboard that you need for a simple machine like this. And also, just in addition to his bike, I've got one extra point. Look. My own little glove box here where Paul could put his cosmetics and all his makeup because he does wear a lot of makeup, you know. <laughs> you know, you know, I knew this would turn into a slangy match. I knew it would be a bad idea coming out for a day with him. Actually, I don't know why Wayne's not riding this bike because look how low and close to the ground these mirrors are. Perfect for short people for doing the hair. Great that, isn't it? But these things are dead, dead easy to operate. Really simple. That's probably why we brought Wayne with us today. Turn the key on like that, ignition's on, press the start button, nothing happens. It's broke. No, it isn't broke. You need to press a brake. Any of the brakes will do. In this case, press the brake, brake, start button, and that's it. Away you go. It's now in gear, twist it, and you can ride all day long. Fairly slowly at first, I'll admit, but the acceleration is quite steady, and before you know it, you're whizzing along at, well, 30 miles an hour, in the case of the 50cc Cobra. The Spacer, on the other hand, could zoom along at an impressive 65 to 70 miles an hour. Although I have to say that from a standing start, it's really no faster than the little two-stroke Cobra. This model is the Cobra Cross, and it's fitted with some chunky little tyres to give it that off-road look, something which Wayne just couldn't resist. It's definitely 10 out of 10 for effort on Wayne's part, although with limited ground clearance and just 5.2 horsepower, I don't think Montessa, Beta or Gas Gas will have too much to worry about. The four-stroke Spacer is more of a city slicker. It looks trendy and it has a nice, comfortable, feet-forward riding position. It's ideal for the office worker who doesn't like the idea of getting his nice, shiny brogues covered in road dirt. Not to mention getting stressed out when the office junior has claimed the last space on the company car park. The motor is fairly willing between 20 and 40 miles an hour, exactly the kind of speeds for commuting into a busy city. You do, however, need to think ahead before attempting to overtake other vehicles. Power delivery isn't exactly instantaneous, but you should remember that these are scooters. They're designed to do a job and they're not some modern superbike. 
Both of these Kimco machines are well equipped and they're very easy to ride. And for a name which 12 months ago I'd never heard of, I'm very impressed. Well, Paul, you're not the only one who's impressed, you know. I'm very impressed because I'm impressed at the value for money of these things. Because some of the 50cc scooters that you can buy from Italy, Spain, Japan can often cost you a couple of thousand pounds for 50ccs. A bike that is very, very much the same as this. The build quality of this, the way it works and everything about it is just as good. Now these come into the country and they start a model that you can buy for £12.95 and this particular one is £15.95. Mm, not bad, eh? Very good. This particular one, actually, this is the 125 uh, four-stroke spacer. This will cost you £2,500. But as I said before, you can have this in a 50cc version, which is physically exactly the same, just with a smaller motor. And would you believe that's just a touch over 1700 quid? I'm well impressed with them, but th there's got to be something wrong with them, Wayne. There, there is. must be some things you don't oh, like. Oh, I found something wrong. Not particularly powerful, is it? Well, that's because it, what it is, it's a 50cc moped. Which is why we put you on that one. Thank you very much, very thoughtful. <laughs> and my feet reach the floor as well, which so, is another point for what? little dwarfs like myself. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I found a fault with this. Go on then. And it's a fault that's actually throughout the range. But, let me just show you. As you lift the bike up, the side stand flicks up. Like a Ducati. Very much the same as a Ducati something and nothing you might say but i'm just thinking of somebody who's a little bit unsure of the machine easy to let go of that and the bike fall over but let's be fair if that's the only criticism i can make of that it's pretty good eh not bad On Two Wheels next week, Wayne tells us all we've ever needed to know about motorcycle intercoms, including the world premiere of his own very latest design.